Amen. Open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. We got these clowns up here, but they have a clock back there now for Rick, I guess. <laughs> Even the seconds. I don't know how you can miss that one, Rick. So I could see the other one, but that's okay. Whatever makes him happy. All right. First Kings chapter 19, verse 15. They really told me the reason they did that for you, Rick, is so that you'd preach shorter. <laughs> I don't know how much truth there is to that, but all right. Verse uh, number 15, 1 Kings 19, verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazio to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, thou shalt anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of uh, abel Hola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So he departed thence, and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me pray, uh, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh uh, with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Please join us now as we look once again to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that you would bless uh, your word tonight uh, as we study it together uh, so that uh, uh, we can gain some insight and see that once we've fallen, once we've gotten into a bad place, once we've become discouraged, uh, you still have uses for us. You still have a way to use, use us. And so we ask that you bless the study tonight that we might gain some insight from that. Perhaps there's one here tonight that's discouraged, defeated, or fallen. And uh, I pray that they be picked up uh, by the strength of your word and by your Holy Spirit to once again uh, serve you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We've been watching the events unfold in the life of Elijah. He fell, became discouraged, and defeated. He ran into the wilderness and prayed to die. He made a journey to Mount Horeb to seek uh, for a word from the Lord. We uh, saw so these things take place. He had allowed the circumstances in his life to become more important and to be more visible than the face of God to him. So when we left Elijah on the mountain, he's still defeated, he's still discouraged, he's still complaining to God in verse 14. Uh, he goes through this whole thing again, how he's been the one who's been faithful, who's been serving, who's done the, the things that should be done. And nobody else is doing it. It's just me, all alone, serving you. There was a day before, a time before, when Elijah had ridden high on the saddle in serving God. He had been thrown off the horse, so to speak, and he was left wounded with the wind knocked out of him. 
So tonight's lesson is back in the saddle again uh, with Elijah. We get to see him as he climbs back into, into the saddle. Tonight, I hope we can learn how that we can come back when we've been down, when we've been defeated, when we've been discouraged, how we can come back. The mending of the prophet involves some things. The healing involves some things. The first one was a new commission. Now, this was a commission of promise. Elijah is told, uh, told to return to Israel to go through Syria. And uh, on this trip, he's to anoint two kings and a prophet. He's given an important assignment, in other words. This assignment from the Lord tells him some things. And that should be important to us. It's evidence that God is not finished with his life. This had to be an encouragement to him. He was no longer ministering. He was running. He was hiding. He was discouraged. And God says, now nah, I've still got a job for you. It's a little different than the jobs he had before. Things have changed just a little bit. But we uh, need to be like him. Those who have wandered, those who have strayed, uh, need to get back on their knees. And come before the Lord. Confess that they've sinned. And just ask for a new, new assignment. Now, I can tell you the Lord's not done with you yet or you wouldn't be here. So you need to be finding out what God wants you to do. The new assignment may not be what it was before. Uh, he's not going to stand on Mount Carmel again. Uh, he's not going to make the bold stands that he did make. But God has a job for him to do. And whatever job God, ha uh, God has for you is an important job. It's an important responsibility. The Lord is faithful. And we always must remember that. And he forgives us in our failures. Always does. First John 1, 9. I suspect somebody could quote that out here, couldn't they? Anybody? Nobody knows it? See, don't be bashful. That's, that's not a trick question. Good job. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, Elijah will not be what he was before, but he's still going to be a blessing. God may change after, our, after we fall and falter, but we can still be a blessing to others. We can still be used of God. Those who have gone through circumstances that eliminate them for, from certain positions, for example, being a pastor would be one. Doesn't mean that God can't forgive and use them. He may not be able to be a pastor again, or a deacon again, or a Sunday school teacher, but God will use them in a certain way. Now, he has a, first, uh, a new commission, and it is a commission of peace. He is to anoint Jehu king over Israel. That means something here. That tells us that Ahab and his reign of wickedness is soon going to be coming to an end. If he's going to anoint a new king of Israel, Ahab, the problem king, is going to be gone. God is going to replace him. And God tells him who to anoint. It's a promise that his enemies will perish. As you read through this, and you read uh, uh, in verse 16, verse 17, uh, we find that some of these kings are going to kill people, the enemies. 
and it gets down, the ones that are left, Elisha's gonna take care of uh, with that. So it's, it's a, a promise that things are gonna change. This means that the message that he has preached before is now vindicated. God is doing what he said he would do. The events and trials have taxed his physical, spiritual, and mental reserves But now they're coming to an end. Now, you might be walking through some very dark valleys. It's very possible that you're in one of those tonight. But I can tell you this, they'll not last forever. How's the verse said? This too shall pass. Don't get lost in the valley. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Don't get lost in the valley. God is always there. He is faithful, and he'll see you through whatever difficult days you face as we go through this world. God is greater than all those things which disturb us. He is greater than all of those, and he will give the victory. Matter of fact, he already has. As I said, even though we walk through uh, the deepest, darkest valley, he is with us. God will go with you. God will be your comfort. God will be your help, and God will be your protection. He will always see us through. It also involved a new comfort. Look at verse 18. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. And this is a comfort of a kindred spirit. Now, twice in verse 10 and verse 14, Elijah had complained that he's all alone. Now, that he alone had devotion to the Lord. No one else cared. I want to tell you, and it's easy sometimes for us to look around and say, well, so-and-so's not doing this, and so-and-so's not doing this, and so-and-so's not doing this, and why should I? We have people that do that. The reality is, We need to be careful with that. God has people doing things that you may not see. You know, it's amazing. I'm pastor of this church, but every now and then I run across somebody that's doing some things behind the scene that I didn't even know they were doing. You know, that's a blessing, isn't it? You're not alone in it. It looks sometimes like nobody cares. Sometimes it can be discouraging. But just realize that you are never the only one doing anything. God has other people out there. God tells him there are 7,000 others who have not worshipped Baal. Now, wait a minute. He said, have not worshipped Baal. These are not people that just Johnny come lately's. Through all that Elijah's gone through, these 7,000 were out here. You know, wouldn't it have been a little better if Elijah had not left his servant behind, gone in the wilderness by himself, prayed that God would take his life? Wouldn't it have been better if he could have sought out some of those and found encouragement and help with them? He was never alone. He just thought he was. There are others who will stand with him. He's learning now that they are there. So he's given some hope and he's given some encouragement. Let me tell you, no matter where you are and what you're doing, and you're never alone. Now, 
you may need help in doing what you're doing. You may not have all the help that you want, but you're never alone. There are always position here, positions here that need to be filled. People don't always jump in and fill those. But that doesn't mean there are not others that are serving the Lord. And I can, we can, it's easy to get your eyes focused on what's not happening instead of what is happening. To be thankful for what God is doing, not what is not happening with other people. So there are those who will stand with them. So he's given hope and encouragement. And uh, we need to remember, whether it's discouragement, depression, sin, or anything else you can name, there are some other people that have been through it. And they survived it. God has given them the strength. And even if there isn't human help, if no human comfort can be found, God always knows what you're going through. And it's his desire to be your comfort and your help. He's an ever present to help you through any crisis that you might face. And then he has the comfort of a knowledgeable Savior. Elijah here is reminded that he has a big God. A God who knows all. He's serving a big God. It seems to me that Elijah had forgotten that God knew all about him. His problems, his enemies, and where the solutions were. But God always knew. God knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows what's happening in your life. But we're too often like the children of Israel, sizing up the inhabitants of Canaan. They had a God who brought all kinds of plagues on Pharaoh who allowed Moses to lead them out as Pharaoh actually ran them out of slavery. And then when Pharaoh changed his mind and they were cornered at the Red Sea, what did God do? He parted the sea. And when the Egyptians followed through, God just closed the sea back up. You see, they knew all of that. They were seeing the manna. They were seeing the quail that God was providing. So they come to the promised land. God said, I have a land for you. So what did they do? They had to check God out. See if he was telling the truth. So they just sent those 10 spies down. And what did the spies do? They came back. And they said, whoa. This is not good. There's giants down there. Those, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. Only Joshua and Caleb brought back a good report. But they looked around at the land and forgot about the God who had brought them this far. You always wonder how we can forget what God has done in the past and then say he can't do anything in the future. God is still the same. He saved you. He changed you. He delivered you. He, he put you on a solid rock. Do you think the God who changed your life has forgotten about you? These people now were like those in the wilderness. They were looking at the inhabitants of the land instead of listening to God. In our figuring and in their figuring, we fail to calculate the Lord. Someone said, and I don't remember where it originated from, 
that God in one is a majority. But I got a better than that. God is a majority. Whether there's one with him or not. God is always going to be right and always there. But he has uh, the provisions already in place to meet our needs and to get us out of the valley that we get in. You see, God wasn't caught off surprise, caught by surprise with Elijah. He knew about the 7,000 all along. Elijah just didn't look around. He has the provisions there for him. And then it involves a new companion, new companion in verse 19 through 21. His name is Elisha. They enjoyed fellowship. When Elijah went into the wilderness, he left his servant behind in verse 3. He was all alone. God knew something here. He knows it's not good for us to be alone. And he gave him a man named Elijah. Elijah was going to be his companion until God calls him home. And he would take Elijah's place when his ministry ended. So they both have a common call from God and both wanted to see the Lord honored and glorified. I fear that maybe in this day, and I've been around long enough to see a lot of changes in churches, in Christians, I fear that we no longer know just how desperately we need one another. You can't do it by yourself. You can't go it alone unless the Lord puts you in that place for a short time. We need one another. Too many Christians want to be like the Lone Ranger, even forgetting that they had a tunnel with them. God called none of us to ride the range alone. He called us to be active in his work, seeking fellowship with his people. Now, that means we have to be dedicated to the work. What did Elisha do when Elijah called him. He said, well, I need to go back home and tell my parents what I'm doing. This wasn't an excuse. It was honoring his mother and father. And then when he came back, he killed one of the oxen. He burned the instruments to... to have a big barbecue, if you will. And what he's doing is getting rid of the things which put him, would put him back where he used to be. Sometimes we need to realize there's some things we need to get rid of if we're really going to serve God. When I first was saved, uh, when I was young, we had a camping trailer. Love to go camping. Kids loved it. That's all I could afford to do anyway. But we, we, we loved that. But when the Lord called me, the first thing I did was sell that trailer. And you know why? Because I knew if I had it, it would be too big a temptation to go back to what I was doing before. So I got rid of it so I could serve the Lord. That's what Elijah did here. He got rid of those things that he was used to having and used to doing. But we need one another. He still calls us to be active. And Elisha was willing to do so. Whether it's the 7,000 or just Elisha. Elijah needed people. 
You take a hot coal from a fireplace and lay it aside, what happens? Soon goes out, doesn't it? But you put the coals together and you get a great fire. Here's a quote. It's an old one I read years ago from a man who got saved. It's a, he's a newly converted alcoholic. This quote from a newly converted alcoholic, uh, alcoholic should cause the church to consider this matter of fellowship. He said, you know, the only thing I miss is the fellowship I used to have with the guys down at the tavern. We used to sit around, laugh, drink a picture of beer, tell stories, let our hair down. I can't find fellowship like that with Christians. Now, I don't know how hard he looked. I just know what, what he wrote. But the point is, don't we need to spend some time with others? Don't we need to invest our life in others? Some get discouraged. No one should ever come to Cornerstone Baptist Church without having dozens of people walking to them and trying to make them feel at home. How many of you have had the experience maybe of moving, maybe just visiting, going to a church that you're not familiar with? Doesn't it feel kind of awkward? It always did to me when I did. People need to know that people care. We need one another. People crave fellowship. And the church is the place that they should be able to find it. So they enjoyed the fellowship together as they serve God. The concluding words of this chapter are important also. And here it says, and he ministered unto him. In other words, Elisha ministered unto Elijah. God knew the burdens that Elijah had and that they were too heavy for him to carry alone. He had already been discouraged and defeated. So he gave him one to walk beside him through the valleys and through the difficulties. The word ministered here means to attend to or to contribute to or to serve. He filled a void in the life of the man of God, helped Elijah fulfill his task and his calling. During the worst days of the Civil War, an old friend of Abraham Lincoln's, a Springfield, Illinois shoekeeper, a shopkeeper, I'm sorry, named Billy Brown decided to travel to Washington to see his old friend, the President of the United States. An aide of the President asked him if he had an appointment. No, sir, replied Billy. I ain't and it ain't necessary. Maybe it's all right and fitting to have appointments, but I reckon Mr. Lincoln's old friends don't need them. So you just trot along and tell him Billy Brown's here and see what he says. Well, the aide frowned, but went. In about two minutes, the door opened and out came President Lincoln, face aglow. Billy, he said, pumping his old friend's hand, now I'm glad to see you. Come right in. You're going to stay uh, to supper with Mary and me. And as soon as Mr. Lincoln discharged his immediate responsibilities, the two men went back to the house, sat down, on a stoop, as Billy later put it, talked and talked. He asked me about pretty nigh everybody in Springfield. I just let loose and told him about the weddings and the births and the funerals and the buildings, and I guess there wasn't a yarn I hadn't heard in three and a half years. He had been away, and I didn't spend for him. Laugh? You ought to hear him laugh. Just did my heart good. For as I could see what they had been doing to him. Always was a thin man, but Lordy, he was thinner than ever now. And his face was kind of drawn and gray. 
enough to make you cry. Late that evening, Billy said goodbye. The president tried to get him to stay the night, but Billy, not wanting to impose, declined. As they departed, Lincoln said, Billy, what did you come down here for? I came to see you, Mr. Lincoln. But you ain't asked for anything, Billy. What is it? Out with it. No, Mr. Lincoln. Just wanted to see you. Felt kind of lonesome. Been so long since I'd seen you. And I was afraid I'd forget some of them yarns if I didn't get them unloaded soon. Lincoln gazed into his friend's eyes. Do you mean to tell me you came all the way from Springfield, Illinois, just to have a visit with me, and that you ain't got no complaints in your pockets or advice up your sleeve? Yes, sir, that's about it. Tears came to Lincoln's eyes, ran down his cheeks. I'm homesick, Billy, just plain homesick. And it seems that this war will never be over. Many a night I can see the boys dying on the fields and can hear their mothers crying for them at home, and I can't help it. Billy, you'll never know just what good you have done me. Two friends in World War I were inseparable. They had enlisted together, trained together, shipped overseas together, fought side by side in the trenches. During an attack, one of the men was critically wounded in the field and uh, filled with barbed wire obstacles, and he was unable to crawl back to his foxhole. The entire area was under crossfire, and it was suicidal to try to reach him, yet his friend decided to try. Before he could get out of his trench, the sergeant yanked him back and ordered him not to go. It's too late. You can't do any good. You'll only get yourself killed. A few minutes later, the officer turned his back, and instantly the man was gone after his friends. A few minutes later, he staggered back, mortally wounded with his friend, now dead in his arms. The sergeant was both angry and deeply moved. What a waste, he blurted out. He's dead and you're dying. It just wasn't worth it. With almost his last breath, the dying man replied, Oh, yes, it was, Sarge. When I got to him, the only thing he said was, I knew you would come. One of the true marks of a friend is that he is there whenever reason, when every reason for him not to be, he's still there. Proverbs 17, 7 says, A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Rather than asking, do I have any friends? Maybe we should be asking, am I a friend? When you become a friend, you will have plenty of friends. Man that hath friends must show himself uh, friendly, according to Proverbs 18, 24. Well, Elijah now is well on his way to recovery. The Lord's ministry in his life has delivered him from the brink of death and of shipwreck. Maybe, just maybe, you need the friendship of one who is closer than a brother. If so, I'm going to tell you he's there. He's waiting to meet you. So maybe we should be looking to find that friend we can minister to and encourage because we have the friend that's closer than a brother. Let's stand for prayer. While eyes are bowed and eyes are closed, maybe the Lord would want to be drawing you back into a place of service tonight. Maybe you're discouraged and about ready to quit. Don't be an Elijah. Look around you. There are a lot of friends, a lot of people serving, a lot of people doing things. But when we take our eyes off our God and put them on our circumstances, we get discouraged. Don't let that happen to you. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we ask your blessing tonight as we conclude, conclude the service with an invitation hymn. We ask your will be done in each of our lives, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name.
Amen.